Hey guys, this is the Cynical Christian again. I wanted to talk a little bit today about this myth of the uh, Dark Ages. You hear this all the time when you're debating online with the atheists who pretty much watch, you know, Bill Maher and all of that stuff, so they're getting these secondhand facts. Um, most historians don't believe there is such a thing as the Dark Ages. Even the medieval period is actually kind of um, a little suspect because what, what's happening is there's this bias here where, you know, there's this... Um, praise for the renaissance period okay in the history of art uh and, and art architecture and classical music um so there's this real emphasis on the renaissance which looks back to antiquity as the glory days so you have the glory in the renaissance you have the glory of um of rebirth in the renaissance and the glory of the you know, ancient greek and roman world but then we just kind of breeze through what's called the middle ages so we can get from point a the ancient world and just jump over that and you know nothing happens in the middle ages and then we get to the renaissance and wow you know we're humanistic and mankind is reborn and all of that truth of the matter is nothing could be further from the truth and it's, it's kind of sad excuse me i had a drink it doesn't do very much justice to history first of all a lot was happening in the middle ages uh, we often hear that science, you know, the church destroys science, and I don't know who's coming up with that crap or where it's coming from, but it's truth of the matter is it's just not true. According to Dr. Lawrence M. Principe of uh, John Hopkins University, PhD in the uh, history of science, he was talking about this saying, um, this is ridiculous. There's two main prominent figures, and I've talked about them before. Uh, John William Draper and Andrew Dixon White, who founded Cornell University, and they had a political agenda. So they wrote these uh, treatises, which is like, you know, works and writings, on the, quote, long history of conflict between science and religion for political motives. But no genuine historian uh, of science, actual historian of science, you subscribes to what we call the conflict uh, thesis model. They just don't. There is a, a complicated and nuanced, very nuanced um, relation between, between relationship between science and religion throughout world history. Science, nobody has a monopoly on science. The atheists don't, the Christians don't, the Muslims don't, the Hindus do. The bottom line is they've all contributed something to science. Um, um, Mendeleev, who created the periodic table, starts out as a Russian Orthodox uh, uh, person and ends up becoming a, an atheist. He gave us the pretty periodic table. However, he was basing his work off um, off the work of um, John Dalton, who was a, a deeply religious Quaker, uh, who gave us basically the idea of categorizing the atomic weights to begin with. So you have one atheist and one Christian. Now taking this whole idea, oh, and then of course you have the Muslims with their contributions with mathematics, which we're going to get into in a minute. Hindus gave us basically the Hindu Arabic numerals that we use today. They also were the first to give us quadratic equations. Uh, they were master astronomers. The list goes on and on. Uh, science is a human endeavor. Nobody calls a monopoly on that, but humanity. And I would argue that humanity is making sense of the, the creation in which God has created. So, um, you know, I, I think maybe the old um, natural theologists like uh, John Ray and William Paley pretty much had it right. Um, but anyway, instrumentalism and natural philosophy aside, we go back to the ant antiquity and the Renaissance, the Middle Ages, okay? It's often thought, you know, incorrectly so, that the Middle Ages, the Christianity, is what caused science to collapse. And if it weren't for those pesky Christians and the church, man, we would have pertained the knowledge of the, the ancient world. And But the Christians, it's the, the, the teach, the, you know, the church, teach, the church, the church doing this, yarg, yarg, yarg. Truth of the matter, is that not true? The reason a lot of that knowledge collapsed was the following. It was mostly because of Rome. Now, the, the ancient Greeks were obsessed with mathematics and learning for learning's sake. Um, they would sit there and do geometry just for the sake of the exercise as it does for the brain. However, the Romans were very, very practical-minded people. They would do some of the mathematics. They would use it for their engineering, like Vitruvius, would, would uh, their, arch their prime architect and engineer you hear in out of an ancient Roman man named Vitruvius. He would use, they would use these mathematics for engineering aqueducts and uh, plumbing systems and uh, things like that, you know, um, and they would use it for all sorts of architectural engineering, you know, perspective, and, or not perspective yet, uh, different things like that. Uh, they would use it for weaponry. They would use of our weaponry, but they were very practical minded. So they didn't get much into the whole, um, you know, natural philosophy, finding the RK, what the universe is made of. They weren't as in depth. They were, they didn't, they just didn't care as much. It's not that it, they didn't care. 
Uh, all of that, it, well, there was not some of it there, but the bottom line is the, the, the idea of learning for learning's sake and abstract mathematics and philosophy was just not as important to the Romans as it was to the Greeks because the Romans were too busy being a military might. Everything had to be weaponry and building civilization and, you know, this world domination and for the glory of Rome. They didn't have time to worry about what the universe is made of and, and all of this stuff and, you know, you know, setting up all these academies. Now, is there learning in Rome? Yes. Does some things carry a uh, uh, do they carry some things on from Greece? Yeah, of course they adopt um, after the Illyrian Wars. Uh, they fight Greece. They they bring in the, the Egyptian or excuse me the Greek religions. They adopt those gods and rename them. Uh, a lot of things about Greek architecture. Later on in the Roman period, they're going <clears throat> to uh, develop their own sense of identity. So they're kind of going to leave Greece behind a little bit and let those guys over you know in that peninsula do their thing. And we are the glory of Rome. The bottom line is because of this, because of this. We were not as in, interested in, as much in Greek culture as we were before. They start losing, you know, they lose sight of the Greek language. Natural philosophy is not as important to them. Um, so, and, and the Greek language is starting to wane. Now, in certain times of the Roman period, during Roman schools, especially with the upper class, to be considered a, um, you know, an elite, uh, educated, good Roman citizen, a lot of those citizens were bilingual and taught their kids to be. The same way I live on the border, close to the border of Mexico, we have a lot of bilingual people down here. We have the English speakers, Spanish speakers that will speak both. In Europe, in, um, you know, certain times of Europe, um, I believe it was like the 1800s, it was considered classy to be able to be an Englishman, an Englishman who could also speak en français, oui, to speak French. Um, the same way, this is the way, the way that the Romans had viewed the Greeks. If you were a Roman who spoke Latin, the language of Rome, but you spoke Green, Greek, you were considered classy, sophisticated. That was part of a classical education. However, in the later Roman periods, that would wane. So what's happening is they're losing their, their desire to study Aristotle and Plato because they're not interested in natural philosophy or even a lot of philosophy as a whole. Sure, you have stoicism. Sure, you have things like that. But um, a lot of the natural philosophy. So Plato, Aristotle. Aristotle, um, you know, a lot of this sort of stuff is getting kind of cast uh, aside. They're just not uh, Archimedes, you know, yeah, he did a lot of technological inventions, but he was more concerned with the abstract use of mathematics. Romans really, at this point, couldn't care. So they start losing um, sight of the importance of Greek learning. They start losing the Greek language. When the Roman Empire, you know, breaks into four semi-governed segments, and then ultimately into two, the Eastern and Roman Empire. You have the Western Roman Empire in, in what is modern-day Italy, and then over in um, modern-day um, Turkey, uh, you have um, the Eastern Roman Empire, You Constantinople, Constantine. The empire is splitting in half. What happens is that the language... Uh, the Latin is basically start, you know, Greek dies in the Latin West, thrives in the East. So in the East, you still have um, a Greek speaking world, which can read Aristotle, which can read Plato. The West cannot. So losing sight of that language, they start losing sight of those texts. Now, in the Roman tradition, uh, most of what they were doing was popularizing. You know, we hear a lot of times like scholars will write scholarly works, but then they write popular works too. And one of them are for like the, the highly intellectual PhDs to study. And the other ones are kind of for the masses. Not that that's a bad thing for the vulgar, for the uh, profane, for the ordinary folks. So we can understand. And by the way, I like both. I can study. I can. I love a good scholarly edition, but then I like to watch the History Channel and get some good pop education too. So um, the Romans are basically preserving the pop versions of education. So you kind of have, and I don't want to say the dumbed down, but I'm just trying to think of another term to use. The Romans are losing their Greek. They're using encyclopedic kind of dumbed down popular versions of uh, knowledge there. So you're losing a lot of the deep thinking, uh, the Greek, the, you're losing sight of these texts. Um, and then you have on top of that, as you know, Rome didn't so much fall as it did dwindle out because you Rome was had spread itself so thin. There's many factors that go into this. That one ends up what ends up happening is they're hiring mercenaries from barbarian tribes like the Visigoths and the Goths and and uh, so on and so forth. Even I believe the Vandals later on uh, would eventually become the well, yeah. Anyway, um, I don't remember. It's been a while. Anyway, so these barbarians to, they have to pay these barbarians. So they get the barbarians coming in to fund their army to conquer the territory, but then they got to pay the barbarians, so they have to sell back the territory to pay their army. And so, oh, you have all these barbarian tribes influencing. And throughout all of this, um, you know, knowledge starts getting lost. People are more worried about not getting their head caught off by the next barbarian tribe than they are, you know, Aristotle's four causes. The efficient 
what is it? The efficient, the formal, the material, and the um, the final. Uh, anyway, they don't care about this stuff. They don't care about this. They're trying to survive as the Roman empires collapse into these barbarians. So finally, when it actually dwindles down in 476, I believe with Romulus, ironically, being the last emperor who basically just abdicates the throne, and when the barbarians take it, don't quote me if I'm quote me if I'm wrong here, but I think the la I think the barbarian king replaced it. I think that was Odovacher. Do not quote me. Check me. If I'm wrong, give me the right answer. Post it on the thing. I don't want him to tell you wrong, but I think so. I'm, I know I got to be right. Um, so anyway, but so between the barbarians, the expansion of the empire falling apart, the loss of Greek, uh, the fact that they're not translating tests, you, a lot of knowledge gets lost. So when the Catholic church comes about, Constantine being seen, I mean, uh, being seen as the first pontiff or pope, uh, and by the way, I'm no fan of the Vatican. I'm no fan of the Catholic teaching. I don't dislike Catholics. It's not that. It's a theological thing. Um, so I, I don't recognize that theology. But when that happens, what happens is basically the Roman Empire or what's left of it becomes Christianized. A lot of times for political reasons, uh, everybody's becoming Christianized. You, if you're a pagan, you can't really buy and sell and trade as much. Better become a Christian so you can keep that that thing going. Anyway, that being say, that being said. So you have this Christianized pagan barbarian hybrid with some pagan sun gods, Jesus overtones thing happening here in Rome. It becomes Christianized and basically the Catholic Church takes over. It comes in and the papacy becomes the center of power. So pa the papacy and the papal states are actually inheriting, you know, what Rome has left behind. And then you have the barbarians, which a lot of them couldn't even read. So they're not going to be literate. They're not going to be able to preserve anything. So between barbarians and the papacy and, and uh, you know, basically adapting um, limited knowledge, no knowledge of Greek, uh, very, very limited uh, amounts of text that had been translated, maybe a few, um, uh, and basically everything kept, uh, you know, kept over in the East, the West, you know, intellectually was dying. And the Catholic Church basically just took that over. So you've got that. Uh, it wasn't that they're dumb Christian people. It's that there were a lot of social and political and economic factors and, um, you know, just attitudes from the Roman Empire, not from the Christian believers or the followers of Jesus Christ, but from the Roman Empire that just didn't care about those things. And then they lose their Greek and then they lose, you know, their books are limited and then they have limited access. And then there's the barbarians and their places falling apart. The, the Colosseum and the roads are being torn down for people in the mutal or for the Middle Ages to, you know, build homes and create their little feudal states. And a lot of those kings, the feudal states were leftover Roman like political leaders. Uh, so amidst all this crap, Knowledge, who cares? Your idea is, you know, create your feudal state, survive, get your little clan, uh, you know, oh, and, you know, here's some Christianity here too, uh, at least a version of it. So it's not as cut and dry as people think. However, over in the East, it's a different thing. It's a whole different animal. In the East... You have the, uh, later on, you would have the uh, Muslims who, yes, you have the sword and sand, you have the sword and barbarian types, uh, tribes always coming in from the sands that are creating chaos. But after a while, a lot of those people would settle down and decide they gave up the desert life, the nomadic life, the, the you know, spread it along by the sword kind of thing. And they started settling uh, down around like rivers, like they do in the ancient world. And one of those places, uh, those one of those places in the 11th century AD was the Abbasid Empire, which founded Baghdad, uh, modern day Baghdad. Um, they were interested in learning. They wanted to learn. And they actually, um, used Arabic. Arabic was used as a language the same way as a universal language of the Middle East, the same way that Latin was in Europe and the same way that, um, you know, uh, Akkadian was in the ancient world. So in the East, they're using Arabic language to unify uh, all sorts of learning, mathematics, astronomy, uh, map making. The um, thing is, it's not just the Muslims. They're spearheading it. But there were other Christians. There were uh, other Christians that were getting on board with them and Jews. And a lot of these guys were living side by side just fine. Uh, don't always believe everything your media says. Um, yes, granted, I know that there's a uh, Islamic political uh, movement. Yes, I get that. I get that. I, I, I have no doubt that terrorism is a real movement. But I also know that our media likes to feed a frenzy. So we've got to be wise in our decisions and not just be hasty and jump on everything. We don't want to be negligent about things, right? If there's a real threat, I don't want to be, I don't want to be stupid. But at the same time, I want to be careful not to say that there was always a time when all these people were always at war. It's the same thing they do with Christianity too. They do it with everything. You know, if you know your history, you understand what's up. The bottom line is you had these, these Muslims and Christians and Jews living side by side that created this thing called the House of Wisdom, where they would actually send their people into Egypt to bring back information. Um, you know, we know the Rosetta Stone 
as being the slab that ancient Egypt, um, I think it was Champion, that um, that brought it back, and then they found that the uh, you had the hieroglyphs and the Greek, and then the um, Demotic, and then they basically that's how we got Egyptian um, learned the Egyptian language. However, it's believed that those guys from the House of Wisdom and the you know the eleven uh, eleventh century A.D. had it long before um, that they had already been sending people down there to translate it into Arabic, uh, preserving maths and sciences in Arabic. Christians, Muslims, and Jews, all people of religious faith, different theologies, but getting along fine. We're actually advancing astronomy and medicine and map making. Okay, the medicine because in the Islamic tradition uh, that was one of their their uh, tenets was this idea of healing and helping. Um, yes, I understand. There's very, very questionable and some bad, 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 bad lines of the Quran. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not praising the theology here. Okay, I'm a Bible believing Christian. I'd I hear there are no other gods before me. Jesus is the only path. That's okay. That's that's a given. But they were advancing the causes of medicine, astronomy. Well, you have the sea, you have the the moon, you have the cycles of the moon and Ramadan. So they have to watch the stars more um, carefully to observe Ramadan, and then they have to pray to Mecca, face of the east. So then their map making abilities become greater, and then of course their. Um, Medicine is, because this is Islamic duty, but of course in the Christian faith, we're all about the healing thing, so this works great for everybody. Surgery on the eyes, cataracts uh, in, 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 are, is invented. Um, it's believed that, uh, I believe it was Al-Tusi was an Arabic mathematician. Uh, that actually, it was I, his ideas that was, I don't want to say stolen, but borrowed and reapplied by uh, the Polish astronomer Nicholas, or Nikola Koper, Nikola, Nicholas Copernicus. I think I got his first name right. Forgive me, that, that sounds dumb. The Copernicus borrowed his, borrowed his ideas, who he in turn borrowed it from the ancient Greeks, uh, like uh, Claudius Ptolemy. Um, so there's that. Um, not only that, but even in the West, there were the people that were actually preserving knowledge were, guess who? The monasteries, okay? The monasteries. Why? Um, give you a prime example. A gentleman by the name, he was a Roman, uh, a Roman statesman, he was a Roman politician by the name of Cassiodorus, um, and I, he uh, created what he called the Institutionis, uh, the Vivarium, it was a monastery, he himself wasn't a monk, but he set it up, and it was a monastery, but they would actually create technologies to uh, irrigation systems, water clocks, uh, they, they preserved and uh, they preserved the calendar because they had to, you know, keep time of the days and months and years for the holidays, the Christian holidays. Uh, also, uh, you had the liturgy, liturgy that had to be preserved, so they were preserving writings as well. Okay, uh, one example of that was um, uh, Saint Isidore of Seville, and he wrote a series of things called the Etymologies, which again helped preserve those Roman texts uh, in the encyclopedic tradition. Okay, uh, and then Pope Benedict, or not Pope, yeah, Pope Benedict, Saint Benedict. I'm sorry, Saint Benedict. Excuse me, Saint Benedict again was preserving writings and. Um, uh, a lot of this stuff, there were some texts that were translated actually into Latin, not as many, but there were some, and it was the monks, it was the monasteries, it was the religious folks that were preserving the writing, that were actually advancing what little knowledge they had. In the East, it was exploding. In the West, it was being preserved. And these are all religious folks, Islam, uh, Muslims, Jews, Christians, Catholics, every freaking body. Okay, so the idea, and, and, then, our, and then it is from that Eastern tradition mostly, on one hand, that your uh, Western Renaissance explodes, right? Because you have the Venetians later that would trade with the East. The people out of Venice, the southern Italian port, would trade, okay? And it is via this way from the East that that Eastern preserved uh, influence, the are some of the art and churchy stuff from Constantinople, a lot of the science and mathematics come in via Venice. And... Um, and of course, give rise, it spreads and gives rise to our modern day renaissance, which of course helps explode the scientific revolution, you would call it. Um, this revolution, evolution, you know, the philosophy of science is its own thing. So, um, so yeah, a lot of this stuff is just not true. When you hear all of this stuff, they talk about, hey, it was the church, you know, stopped it in the middle age, yard. Um, no, that's really not true. If had anything, the church helped preserve knowledge and advance the cause of knowledge. And many folks of many religious faiths were actually pushing it up to the next level, if you assume that it's progressive. Um, uh, anyway, not adaptive or whatever. Um, but yeah, so when you hear somebody say the dark, you know, the Christians, uh, uh, you know, and the religious people gave us the dark ages. Uh, no, 
Rome and its conquest gave us the Dark Ages, and they're not Dark Ages because there was a lot happening. You had Saint Augustine uh, with his writings. You had uh, uh, you know uh, Saint Augustus of uh, of Hippo. Later, you'd have Saint Thomas Aquinas, and a lot of these have some of the grandest theology and philosophy. And not only that, theology. People like Aquinas and or, uh, Aquinas and August Augustine were looking at theology and the Bible with a very critical eye. They were being very systematic. They were being critical about the way they approached the Bible. Uh, proper exegesis. They were taking the scriptures and trying to interpret it. It is that tradition that carries over through Christianized Europe. Christianized Europe takes that looking. We see that there's laws in the Bible. There's moral law. There's divine law. And we want to be very critical about the way we look at this and the way we interpret this. That gets translated into natural philosophy. When we become natural philosophers, continuing that, we take that critical, proper practice of theology, and we apply that to the natural world. And we get what you would often call the scientific method. Be careful here. I would argue there's not an actual scientific method. I've explained why in my other video. We'll click on there is no scientific method. I'll try to explain the whole thing. Click on my video. There's no scientific method. But the idea of it was uh, called Whitehead's thesis in the history and philosophy of science. It said that men became scientific because they believed that there was law in nature, divine law uh, that was given to them, divine law, divine moral law. Therefore, there should be laws in nature as well. So then they become looking for laws in nature. They become they look for regularities. They look for things. You know, if the as Dr. Principe says, if if it was the, the Olympian gods of Zeus said everything would be off balance because they're always angry and they're always mad, they're always fighting with each other, and you can never trust anything to be stable. But with a divine lawgiver and order, you would expect to see order. So they became looking for order. And that advances a mechanistic view in a sense. They're still theologians. They're still, it's not uncommon in this time period, either for the Middle Ages or for the early modern period or the later modern period, even uh, for people to be both theologians and natural philosophers. Uh, uh, Robert Boyle, considered the father of modern chemistry with his corpuscles model, this idea of these little breakdowns, even though he's borrowing sort of on an atomist basis, um, it's a whole different world. He was a theologian. He was an avid Christian. In fact, he set up a series of called the Boyle Lectures uh, where people would basically come in and talk about science to defend the Christian faith, kind of like what we do with Christian apologetics these days. Um, uh, uh, Newton, he was not a Trinitarian. He was not a Trinitarian. He was a Unitarian. And so I don't agree with him the, the, uh, uh, theologically speaking, but he thought atheism was foolish. He thought it was nuts. He couldn't even fathom. In fact, there's an old story that when uh, when Newton had made a model of the solar system and when his friend came in and he asked the friend, who made this model? Uh, or no, the friend asked him, who made this model? Newton said, nobody did. And the friend said, hey, that's insane. He says, no, I'm telling you, nobody did. The friend's like, that's no, um, you know, that's, that's nuts. This model didn't get here by itself. And Newton turned around to his atheist friend. He says, okay, so if I say that this model made itself, you know, that nobody made it, you say I'm insane. But if I say that the, the, the actual solar system, which is much more grand and beautiful and mathematical and beyond anything that I could ever design, you think it happened by chance? That's just nuts, okay? So, yeah, it's just not true. It's not true at all. The, um, uh, John Clerk Maxwell was a devout Christian. He put scripture over his lab. He is uh, known for advancing and basically discovering electromagnetism. He had, I believe, four laws, uh, which, you know, ended up being modified later. Um, uh, Faraday, um, Faraday, um, who basically gave us the, you know, uh, dynamo, the electric, which is the basically predecessor of the electric motor. He was an avid Christian. The list goes on and on and on. J.J. Thompson, who discovered the electron. I have another video called Stick Fights, Atheist versus Theist. It'll explain a lot of this sort of stuff. Um, so this idea, atheism has never and will never have a monopoly on science. And not only that, when you claim God does or doesn't exist, you're already outside of science. You're not doing natural philosophy. You're, not such, you're talking about metaphysics. You're going beyond that. Okay, so uh, when people say, you know, talk about the existence of God or belief in God or not God, uh, you're not even in science, really. You're actually in metaphysics. You're going beyond the natural world. Nobody's arguing that God is nature, okay? Unless you, if you're a Hindu or a pantheist, okay, whatever. But that's a different argument. I don't have to defend a God I don't believe in, only the one I do. And even that, I don't even have to do defend him. Why? Because God and belief about God are not one and the same thing. They're not. Um, the X is not the same thing as belief about X. 
if God exists necessarily, then according to the law of identity, he either is or he isn't. Uh, but my belief about him or my desire for him to be true or false is irrelevant as to if he does. God's existence does not depend on whether or not you believe it. But either way, he precedes time, space, matter, and energy, whatever that means to proceed. I'm using that term loosely because remember, time doesn't come into existence until the physical universe. Our minds can't really grasp eternity, although we can talk about it. Um, so you're, you're outside of anything, you know, trying to, you know, scientific, give me material uh, uh, empirical evidence of God. That's like trying to, you know, you know, they say poke God with a stick, asking for the uh, shape of the color purple, the smell of the number seven, uh, how uh, much tomorrow weighs or from not, what nothing is made. You know, these are absurd questions. They're, they're just absurd questions. The question itself fails. Therefore, it's not even worthy of an answer. OK, you're asking the wrong questions, basically. So, um, you know, this goes on and on and on and on and on. Uh, there is no there is no link between atheism and science. In fact, I would argue that science still has to, whether they want to admit it or not, whether they want to, it has theological and theistic overtones, it almost has to. Okay, it almost has to. Um, but anyway, um, but yeah, when you say that, you know, God and science contradict each other again, it's politically you know, not it's it was a political motive. It's factually untrue. It's philosophically unsound. It's just total crap. And it doesn't remember, matter how many times you repeat that. It really is not even close to the case historically or philosophically. It just doesn't work. But most people aren't going to dig into it this deep. Uh, most of the people are going to hear this say, "I don't even know what he's talking about." But the minute that Bill Maher gets on TV and says, science proves God doesn't exist, all your jumping jack monkeys are, ah, I saw it on the TV show. Ah, I'm trying it. Okay, yeah, okay, cool. Um, Bill Maher, he's a great scientist. Well, did you see the video I did about Bill Maher and the, um, you know, transgender, gender, I'm a tomato trapped in a, you know, turtle's body kind of thing? I mean, come on, man, that guy, <laughs> you know what does they say? A true sign that America's schools have truly failed is when Bill Nye is the face of science in America. This is why I get online and, and talk to foreigners and they tell me I'm pretty smart for being an American. And, oh, sorry, no offense. Well, you know, I, I kind of see where they're going with that. I don't take offense to it, but there, there it is. There it is. So, uh, yeah, it's, you know, we're not, we're known for entertainment. We, we like to bounce and we like shiny clothes and Katy Berry and horse and our ideas of scientists and our knowledge about the his, uh, knowledge about science at all is Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, Bill Nye, Ricky Gervais. What's the old saying? Oh, that's a cool British accent. No offense to my British friends like Josh and Johnny. I, I love you guys. You guys are great, but I'm mocking this idiot. Not you. Yeah, you have cool accents. I wish I had a cool British accent like that. It's just very sophisticated. I like it. Um, you know, Ricky Gervais, he's a comedian. Well, if you're getting your philosophy from a comedian, don't be surprised when it's a joke, as the saying goes. But, um, yeah, this science and religion, science and religion, they're against each other based on what? Not history, not philosophy, not facts. Something your heroes told you on a TV box that's, uh, by the way, controlled by your governments and controlled by global bankers that has an agenda. I quit watching the TV a long time ago. I would, I, I would be, I, I just, no, anyway. Um, so there it is. Uh, there are no dark ages. There is no time when the church stopped science. Most of the time, even the Catholic church, whose theology I don't agree with, actually supported it. They supported it. They pr promoted it. Um, you know, the idea was not the church versus science. It was Aristotelian geocentristic model that had been in the church for like over a thousand years or so, um, basically pairing up with this new revolutionary idea of Copernicanism. Um, and um, Galileo was adapting that model, too. And there's a lot of political things. I'll, I'll do a whole uh, video on the Galileo affair, too, later. Uh, you'll see that that's not science versus religion. They want it to be. They they need it to be. The propaganda artists, they have to have it that way, whether it's not or not. Truth is not concern them. Facts are, you know, ir you know irrelevant, right? Um, so it, it's just, um, there you have it. No dark ages, no oppression of science. It just freaking never happened. Well, what about Giordano Bruno? I can do a video on that one too. I'll, I'll go through anyone. What about Giordano Bruno or Hypatia? Oh, wait a minute. This dumb Christian knows about those things? I thought he'd be bouncing around like a monkey in a praise band. I'm not genie. I'm not special being from Oklahoma. I'm not. I'm not. I'm ed educated. I'm not. I don't. I, I lay a life on a farm with kind of. I'm not that, that guy. Anyway, you guys have a good one. Later.